David Graeber is here. He is an associate professor of anthropology at Yale University. He's also a prominent anarchist and anti-globalization activist. He has participated in some of the largest public demonstrations in recent years, from Genoa to Quebec City. He also helped organize protests against the World Economic Forum in New York, the Republican National Convention, and the G8 Summit in Scotland. Last year, Yale decided not to renew his contract. He will teach his last class at the university this spring. I am pleased to have him on this program to talk about the ideas uh, and the life experiences that he has had. Welcome. Thank you. Let me, let me just start by what happened at Yale. I mean, you, why are they not renewing your contract, as far as you know? As far as I know, it's a difficult question because they don't tell me anything. Um, it's, but do they owe it to you to tell you? Most places do. Yeah. Um, it's a very unusual thing about Yale that they can simply drop you and give you no reason whatsoever. Right. And it was a very unusual thing. I mean, so while I don't know what happened, a lot of the students felt that they did. I mean, originally, it was the students that began the protest. Um, and the overwhelming conclusion of the graduate students is that it had something to do with my defense of one of the uh, graduate students who was a union organizer who they tried to kick out of the program. And, and they think that's behind it in some sense of... Yeah. I'll of, never of, know. I yeah. mean, but that was the conclusion that the students reached, and a lot of the students wanted to organize some kind of protest. They asked me. I said, well, I can't have anything to do with it myself, but go ahead. But it's not about your political views, is it? I mean, uh, th that might... I think might, it entered into it. I mean, that might mm -hmm. be an extension of your political views, whatever mm -hmm. you did. It's an irony. I mean, because I had really tried hard not to get involved in local politics. I mean, I figured... This, the sensible thing to do in a situation like that was to be an activist in New York, and then I would just be a scholar at Yale. Because Yale, there's all these union issues. It's, it's, it's a lot of very bitter controversy, particularly in my department. I just figured I would stay out of it. Uh, but somehow it became impossible. So ironically, actually, um, I got drawn in largely for what I thought was intellectual integrity. I thought the student was a very, very good student, and she deserved to be defended. What interests me about you is not whether you were fired or, or rehired by mm -hmm. Yale. I mean, that's a personal and professional matter. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the principles are, nor do you, because you yeah. haven't been able to find out. I never will. Uh, maybe. The, the, I don't know about that either. But what I'm interested in is that you were, is in terms of, of your own thought and what you, would, what you believe in and, mm -hmm. and why that makes you an interesting character and an interesting t professor mm -hmm. and an interesting uh, uh, thinker. Uh, let's start with that. Tell me what is the sort of core of your own uh, Intellectual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're an anthropologist an by anthropologist. training, and, and you've written about Madagascar and other places uh -huh. where you look at communities that you think seem to be functioning in history. Mm -hmm reasonably well without having the structure of a smoothly performing government. Certainly true. Um, yeah, I'm interested in anthropology because I'm interested in human possibilities. I mean, anthropology, I think, is the only discipline which really is about trying to understand the full range of what has been possible politically, economically, socially, and so forth. Um, and in a way, there's always been an affinity between anthropology and anarchism simply because anthropologists know that a society without a state is possible. There's been plenty of them. They work fine. What are some of the best? Well, I mean, you go to Amazonia, you go to... It's hard to say what's good or what's okay, bad. Okay, I said some of them without yeah. suggesting any particular one. Yeah. I mean, I think that there's thousands of places right now where essentially there is no functioning state where you don't know because it's working out so well. I mean, that's what I discovered in Madagascar. The state had basically pulled up stakes and left from large parts of the countryside, but nobody was stupid enough to sort of put up flags and say, ha, 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 we are independent now. You know, they yeah. were just going on about their business as pretending it was there. And it took me perhaps six months to figure out what was going on, and I was living there. Now, from those observations comes a political philosophy about anarchism? Well, I was always interested in the idea of anarchism. I think that experiencing it makes it real in a certain way, living in a place like that. Um, because I think, as an idea, anarchism is very appealing to a lot of people. It's certainly very appealing to me. I mean, most people think it would be nice to live in a free society where people simply governed themselves and there wasn't a systematic structure of coercion regulating you all the time. Um, but most people can't imagine that it could ever happen. So when you see examples of it's happening, when you see anarchy in action and it works, 
it just changes your perceptions of what's possible in society and in human life. Let me move from sort of that. I mean, that is an interesting idea, and and um, whether actions with respect to protests you've been involved mm -hmm. in, you know, are they acts of anarchy, or and, and, yes. and what would be the definition of anarchy? Okay. That that I guess I could give drive you drive you to do those kinds of things, which mm -hmm. a lot of other people I have talked to mm -hmm. you know, may or may not consider themselves anarchists. They may have simply consider themselves responding to a cause that they think demands the kind of protest they mount. Mm -hmm. Well, anarchists, well, first of all, the very idea of protest is a little alien to anarchist philosophy. Anarchists more believe in the idea of direct action. Protest, you're kind of appealing to the powers that be to be nicer. We don't do that. We try to directly intervene. If there's something going on that we don't like, we put our bodies in front of the road. Or, mm -hmm. um, the classic definition of direct action, for example, is you know if there's a community that doesn't have drinking water because there's no well, you know, we, normal political action, you go to the governor and you sign a petition, or you, um, you could even blockade their house, but that still isn't direct action. Direct action is you go off and dig the well yourself and dare them to stop you. Um, so in a way, anarchism is about acting as if you're already free. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, if you want to define anarchism, well, I guess you could have a short version and a long version. The short version is simple. Anar anarchism is democracy without the government. You know, most people really, most people love democracy. And most people don't like the government very much. If you keep one and take away the other, that's anarchism. Um, anarchism is direct democracy would be another way to put that. Um, I guess the longer version would be anarchism is a commitment to the idea that it would be possible to have a society based on principles of self-organization, voluntary association, and mutual aid. Um, it's not the belief that we're necessarily going to have it, that it's certain that we could have it. No, you can't know it's possible. But just uh, from the same token that you can't know that it is possible, you can't know that it's not possible. So if you feel that it's better to commit yourself to the idea that it might be possible, then you're an anarchist. Going at a specific action, uh, in terms of protest against um, the World Bank or or the G8, mm -hmm. what's the or is what's the protest about for well, you? I think and it's how two does that things. fit into anarchy? Okay, what's well, an example of direct action? Um, you're doing two things at once. On the one hand, you're trying to expose the mechanisms by which power actually works in the world, which most people aren't aware of. The thing about the World Bank, the IMF, most people in America didn't even know that they existed. And most people, when they found out what they were and what they did, didn't actually like them very much. Uh, but it's not just a matter of exposing the structures of power, but sort of exposing the structures of power in a way that itself embodies an alternative, sometimes called prefigurative politics. And that's very much a key part of direct action. So you're not only showing how undemocratic the structures that run the world are, but you're doing it in a way that provides a model of what democracy could be like. And one of the most incredibly inspiring things for me about taking part in these actions was the spokes councils. Uh, democratic process, it's a big word for anarchist process, uh, because it's all about reinventing new forms of democracy. And if you sit in a room and you see there's 3,000 people collectively making a decision by consensus without any leadership structure, it just completely changes your idea of what's possible for human beings to do. So I think that's, that's equally important to exposing structures of inequality and domination that you don't like in the world, to do it in a way that shows that they're not necessary, that there's other ways to go about things. Is globalization a bad idea? No, no, I think globaliz I think most anarchists are much more in favor of globalization than the people that they oppose. Then, then I'm sorry? Than the people that they oppose. I don't think the IMF, the World Bank, are particularly in favor of globalization in any meaningful sense of the term. Yeah. If you think that globalization is the effacement of borders and the free movement of people, possessions, and ideas. Let's define it that way. Well... Good idea. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, of course, anarchists are opposed to the very existence of international borders because we don't believe in nation states. Uh, at the same time, you know, if you look at what actually happens with globalization, first of all, free movement of people 
It's not what it's about at all. I mean, the, dump, the border guard between U.S. and Mexico has tripled since the signing of NAFTA. And because the way what they call globalization actually works, it's all about trapping people in places where you then remove social security, right. um, creating people desperate enough to undersell each other, and allow corporations to move around to take advantage of it. I mean, I, we don't think that's real globalization. Does anarchy have a future? I think so. Well, I mean, I think we're at a really interesting historical moment. I think in a lot of ways, we've kind of returned to what was happening a century ago. If you think about the sort of classic days of anarchism, was the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, uh, up to World War I, basically. That was a period of relative global peace, and it was a period much like the age of globalization. People used to say things like, I remember reading someone writing in 1901 saying, it's hard for us to remember these days that there used to be these things called passports, and people had to show them at borders. I mean, people were just moving around much more freely. The idea of war between what were considered civilized countries seemed to be a thing of the past. And during that period, anarchism became the center of the sort of imaginative revolutionary left. All of a sudden, you had World War I, and which was, as everybody represents it, one of the most foolish wars in history. It wasn't really about anything. Um, and suddenly, anarchism disappears, and Marxism is everywhere, and it seems much more plausible. But if you think about the reasons for that, it seems to me the the 20th century, most historians now think the 20th century ran from about 1914 to maybe 1991, the short 20th century, they sometimes call it. Well, the 20th century was probably the most violent century in human history. Uh, it was almost entirely made up of either fighting world wars or preparing for world wars. Um, and during that period, certainly, I would say anarchism didn't look particularly realistic because the one thing anarchists will never be good at is building gigantic mechanized killing machines, armies. You know, I think that's altogether to our credit. Uh, on the other hand, Marxist regimes often that was about the only thing they were particularly good at. So <laughs> <laughs> they were pretty good at it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you get 1989, 1991, the wall falls, those regimes fall apart. Um, Suddenly, you're back in an age where it seems like you're back in the 1890s. It looks like war between industrialized countries is impossible. You have globalization again. Right. Suddenly, the anarchists are back. And in a way, it's very funny because in the 90s, people were talking about history is over. Um, this is the end of history. Nothing will really change. It yeah, seems only one person to know about that was Francis Fukuyama well, was talking everybody about. Everybody, roof. Everybody kept repeating it. <laughs> yeah. um, it's the line they all gave to us. And now it seems exactly the opposite of the case. History is madly accelerated. It's happening. The same things are happening, but much, much faster. Um, so that you have that period, but it only lasts five or six years, and suddenly the global elites seem to panic. You have this massive internationalist movement. It's anarchistic in sentiment, its ideas are coming out of anarchism, even if most of the people in it aren't themselves anarchists, much like in the 1890s, 1900s. And what do they do? They go off and start a war. I mean, it doesn't really matter who you start a war with. You need to have a war. That's the only way you can really have an excuse to suppress dissent, call in nationalistic sentiments. But in the long term, I don't think it's going to work. I don't think we're going to have another 75 years of world war. I, I, I don't think First of all, it would be possible without blowing up the world. And I think so you're not, well, because of the technology. Yeah. You, because t therefore you're optimistic about the future. Yeah, I'm very, yeah. very optimistic. I mean, I think that what we're seeing now is a kind of panic reaction of global elites who didn't expect to see this. I mean, it's hard for us to remember now the way they were talking back in the mid-90s. That, I mean, back in 2000, we thought it was going to take about 10 years to unseat the Washington Consensus, people in the movement. Now, what's the Washington Consensus? Well, the idea that essentially that all historical questions, economic questions, political questions are over, that um, we'll have a certain type of limited parliamentary democracy, but governments won't really decide on economic policy. We'll have these institutions like the IMF and World Bank, certain type of supercharged, what's called neoliberalism you know, in the rest it, of the world. It, it, yeah. I can make an argument okay. easily. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole, the sense of the acceleration of the Internet's impact on us, mm -hmm. a clearly an international phenomenon. Certainly. Is less than 10 or 11 years in terms of its real impact when, when it began to get momentum, which mm -hmm. was around 95. I mean, you can, yeah. you can go back and talk about Netscape, 
mm -hmm. and a browser and all mm -hmm. those kinds of technological yeah. innovation. Yeah, of course we do. Yeah. But it made, and then search engines and all the things that have, that have erupted, uh, it's been a very short time. And it's accelerated beyond all of our imagination. Absolutely. I think you're right. Um, and we have no idea what it would imply. I mean, this is one of the reasons I think something like anarchism is so important to put on our horizons because it's about trying to reimagine the world, reimagine different ways of relating. And the one thing that we know is history is moving so quickly, things are going to change. Um, the type of capitalism that we have now will not exist in 100 years. What kind of capitalism will exist in 100 years? Maybe something very different. Um, we don't know. Because it there's will no die way we can what? know. It will, it will... Well, I mean, the one thing we know is that well, 100 years will, ago, the world was very different. It will into something yeah. bigger, better, more powerful, mm -hmm. or... I think that we have no idea. I mean, this is my way of thinking of it. We know that 200 years ago, the world was incredibly different. 100 years ago, it was very different. We can... 25 years ago, it was incredibly different. Exactly. I mean, if anything, change is speeding up. Yeah, exactly. Um, change is accelerating. Yes. The velocity of change so, is exponential. The assumption that these questions are answered, that human possibilities um, are pretty much fixed, I think is absurd. We can't guess what the world is going to look like in 100 years, but we can try to create positive examples of alternatives which can inspire people and, and provide ways out. We do know it's going to change. The question is we don't know whether it's going to change for the better or the worse. Before I end this, uh, what are you going to do? Myself? Yeah. Next year? Yeah. Well, um, Yale has actually offered me a year off at full salary for agreeing to go away. So now, see, I can't. Let me. Can I stop you there for a second? It, it, I bet you I could get on the phone and find out uh -huh. why they did not want to renew your contract. Well, I, I, nice. I bet you. I could. No, no. I, bet, I just bet I could. But I bet a thousand other people. Not because I have any particular power. But I bet you could if you really wanted to know. You could find it. Now, you may not agree, and you may think that the premise was false, but you could find out. I bet. But if I knew what I said on television? I mean, if I, you can't say bad things about other professors. I mean, that's, that's taboo. So what you did was criticize other professors? No, but I would have if I said it here. That's much worse than... Oh, you know. So you think it was, in the end... I think in the end, I, I simply, in academia, there's a hierarchy. And you're supposed to be scared. You're supposed to be um, sort of cowering before people. And I was never disrespectful to people, but I didn't cower. What do you mean by cower in this case? Well, I mean, this is what, one reason I'm an anarchist. I think that structures of hierarchy, if you give people complete impunity and power over others, it creates a psychological dynamic which is almost sadomasochistic, you know. Um, does does an anarchy, does it, mm -hmm. to be an anarchist is not to respect authority? No, no, I think um, an anar to be an anarchist is to be critical of authority and to always examine Where authority. Where authority is just by definition. Well, no, to always examine authority critically to see if it's legitimate. Yeah. Uh, and I think there are forms of authority that are legitimate, but you don't worship authority as a thing in itself. Yeah. I mean, for example, take, um, I like the notion of self-subverting authority. Uh, I think there are certain types of authority which undermine their own basis, and I think those are very good. Like a teacher. Uh, if you're a teacher and you teach someone very well, they know what you used to know, so there's no further basis for your authority. Depending on how good a teacher you are. <laughs> so there's no basis for what? There's no further basis for the authority if you're a good teacher. Yeah, yes, because yeah. you need more people to come in because mm -hmm. because it, you know. Well, between those two people, you know, the yeah, relationship well, subverts its basis. Yeah, but, but if you're a doctor and you cure someone, you no longer have any reason to have authority over that person. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, that's, that argument doesn't seem to, to, to have a lot of weight for me because I, it, mm -hmm. in the end, uh, it is not about having authority over people you cure. It's about having the capacity to continue to cure people. Well, that's true. But it's not a relation of authority between the same people. knowledge and another opportunity to create a better result. Right. But the particular relationship. What I think anarchists have problems with are relationships where one person is always subordinate. Or how about always an authority? Well, the two are two sides of the same. I thought so, but I just want to express it the other <laughs> way. Uh, obviously, you can see that I have no 
no, no future in philosophy or anthropology, <laughs> but uh, it's been good to see you here and, and to talk to you about this, and I thank you for coming. And, and uh, you know, if this program stands for anything, it is to sort of reach out and hear what people uh, who may be seeing something different mm. than, than they hear every day. And so I'm appreciative of you well, coming. Really glad to have the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.